Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this, our third and final seminar in the topic Slavery Past and Present. I'm Kate Regan. I'm the director of the Bonavera Institute, and I'm really just here this evening to say a very warm thanks to Samantha Knight, who has moderated these sessions um, so beautifully over the, last, um, over the last term, and I'm sure we'll do again this evening, and also to our very eminent panel this evening, who are going to be talking this evening on modern slavery. Modern slavery is an area of research that the Bonavera Institute engages in, and so we are very delighted to have these very eminent speakers here, and we look forward very much to the event. Thank you very much, Sam, and the speakers, and I'm going to hand you over now to Sam. Thank you, Kate, for your kind comments. I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing tonight's event, and it's a real tribute to um, Bonavera for hosting such an important um, series of of, of, of panels. I'm here um, this evening with Dame Sarah Thornton, who's the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner, with Siddhartha Kara, the British Academy Global Professor at Nottingham University, and Kate Garbers, founder and former director of Unseen. And we're here to look at modern slavery, and in particular, labour exploitation and trafficking as one of the most prevalent forms of modern slavery. Um, it's self-evidently a huge and complex subject. The ILO have estimated that forced labour generates annual profits of 150 billion. Each of our panellists this evening is going to talk from a different perspective. They're going to speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A as always. So please do start putting your questions in the box at the bottom of the screen and I will aim to get to as many of your questions as I can. The session is being recorded and it'll be available to watch later via the website and via YouTube. Before we dive into um, our three panellists, I just will briefly sketch out the legal context as it applies to modern slavery. And I promise um, as a lawyer not to get too legal and too technical. But first of all, what is modern slavery? Modern slavery encompasses human trafficking and slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour. Slavery and trafficking are both terms that are defined in international law, but the de definitions are not without difficulties. As we're going to be focusing tonight on forced labour, I'm just going to mention the definition of forced labour and what that requires. Um, first of all, it requires a threat of penalty, i.e. a threat or use of force, abduction, fraud, coercion, abuse of power or vulnerability. And secondly, it requires service for a benefit. Very significantly, a child does not have to demonstrate the first of these requirements, i.e. Force or, force or coercion. It's assumed in the case of a child. But of course, legal definitions don't always fit well with practicalities. And in the area of labour exploitation, for example, there's a continuum of various forms of exploitation, some of which will be caught by the definition of slavery and force or compulsory labour, and others which won't, depending on the degree and type of coercion and duress. And importantly, forced labour is not, for example, just working for low wages and or in poor working conditions. And it doesn't cover the situation of pure economic necessity. So, for example, where a worker can't leave because of lack of alternatives. Um, next, I just want to, uh, before we begin, just sketch out the, the framework and how it works um, in, in the UK, at least. So uh, we have a Modern Slavery Act, um, in, uh, 2000, which is 2015, and that was designed to give effect to a United Nations protocol relating to trafficking, the Palermo Protocol, and also at the European level, the uh, Council of Europe have adopted a Convention on Action Against Trafficking, and the EU um, has a directive on preventing and combating trafficking. And the aims of these um, international instruments broadly are threefold. One is to prevent slavery and trafficking. Um, secondly, to investigate and prosecute. And thirdly, to protect victims of trafficking. The Modern Slavery Act itself didn't contain provisions on identification, protection and support and assistance for, fiction, uh, for victims. Instead, this was dealt with in the UK by uh, something called the National Referral Mechanism, which sits within the Home Office and provides the machinery for determining whether someone is a potential or actual victim of trafficking. And once identified as a potential victim of trafficking, an individual is entitled to 
uh, minimum financial support and accommodation, counselling, medical care and legal advice. I should also say that when I'm using the um, term victim, that's because it's the term used in the legal um, framework. However, um, many people and many NGOs working in this area prefer to use um, the term survivors. Um, in practice, there are huge problems um, with um, each of the aims um, in the legislation and how they're implemented in practice. So obviously prevention in terms of dealing with root causes is complex. Um, prosecutions in terms of actual numbers have been low and they're extremely difficult and complex and expensive um, cases. And in relation to support and assistance for victims or survivors, um, we also see victims and survivors unfortunately being criminalized, wrongly subjected to deportation in the hostile environment and not always being well supported um, or assisted. So with that introduction, which will hopefully help in terms of framing um, the discussion this evening, I want to turn first of all to Dame Sarah, who as independent commissioner and with a very extensive and high level background in policing and in criminology is working directly with frontline agencies to encourage good practice, to assist with reform and improving law and practice. So um, Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Samantha, and good afternoon, everybody. I thought that I would use some slides, which I'm just going to share, and hopefully that works. Let's put them on the screen. There we go. Okay, um, what I thought I would try and do uh, in my uh, allocated time is talk a little bit about my role, uh, which uh, comes from that Modern Slavery Act Samantha just talked about, try and kind of situate uh, my role in some of the dilemmas uh, in this um, area, which Samantha has already hinted at, and then talk a little bit about a few uh, areas where I try and practically navigate my way through those dilemmas, and hopefully that makes sense. So the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner was created by that Modern Slavery Act, uh, part four. Um, the accountability is through the Secretary of State for the Home Department, so that's the Home Secretary, um, I have to produce an annual um, a strategic plan and an annual report, uh, which she lays before Parliament. And there's a very interesting debate to be had about to what extent that in any way undermines my independence. The rule is that uh, it's only issues of factual accuracy or kind of great government secrets that uh, she can require me to remove, um, but it is a potential tension. Um, I'm very light on resource and light on power, um, but specified public authorities are under a duty to cooperate with me, which includes the National Crime Agency, police forces, um, all the border security organizations, government health um, and regulators such as the gang masters and labor abuse authority. And the role again set out in legislation is um, very high level that I must encourage good practice in the prevention, detection, investigation of prosecution of modern slavery and human trafficking and the identification uh, of victims of these offences. So kind of very high level. So that is my role, uh, which I've been doing since May 2019. So it's coming up for two years. And as Samantha said, I've had a, a history of background, uh, 33 years in policing. And um, when I my um, appointment was announced, I mean, the first thing to say, of course, it was leaked. Uh, to the Sunday Times, I found out that I'd got the job because the Sunday Times rang up the press office where I was working at the time and said, did I have a comment? Uh, which is quite an interesting way to find out that you've got a job. Um, but it then led to other um, uh, newspapers uh, commenting at the time before it was ever announced. Uh, and this kind of, if I didn't realize already that there's contested territory, uh, this for sure explained. Uh, the first is a quotation from The Guardian. Its field is Frank Field concerned about um, the nature of the appointment of a, a law enforcement person, really focusing on law enforcement rather than some of the more broader systemic issues. And then there's a quotation there from the Independent um, at the same time saying, if you think about modern slavery and human trafficking, um, actually they're systemic issues. The economy really relies on exploitable labor and a hostile environment makes undocumented people unable to work for anybody other than those who are willing to flout the law. 
uh, and pushes therefore pushes them into abuse. So, you know, right at the very beginning of my appointment, or fact, even before it was official, um, I was kind of caught in this um, issue about, is it about a criminal justice response or is it about much more systemic issues? And I thought I would just sort of uh, paint out some of those dilemmas to begin with. And Samantha's already mentioned the Paloma Protocol 2000. Uh, which is really interesting because, of course, that was done in terms of an organised crime approach. Um, it was a, an addition to an earlier uh, protocol on organised crime, and it was about preventing, suppressing and pursuing traffickers in persons, especially those who were uh, preying on women and children. Um, and what's interesting and often said, of course, is that protocol um, was very, very widely signed up to across the world. In a way, it's argued, that other um, protocols, for example, the Compact on Migration has never been signed up. The, the, the level of kind of, of, of support from various countries was really quite high. But, but the argument would be that actually it then provided the rationale for thinking about labour exploitation and irregular migration through that criminal justice lens, rather than a much broader uh, lens of migrant or labour rights. I'm not saying that's necessarily right, but of course, this is what, you know, this is the kind of the critique uh, of when you're thinking about, is it criminal justice or is it about the system? Uh, and the argument is, of course, that severe violations continue uh, and uh, migrants are abused and deported despite all the work that many, many people are involved in, in terms of um, modern uh, abolitionism. Um, so the argument is that, um, you know, much wider human rights approach is needed. Um, and just to kind of um, develop that argument, um, some of you might have seen some of the work that Joel Quirk has been doing, a South African-based academic. Uh, this was um, from a, a quotation from a, a paper from Open Democracy back in December, and talking about this critique that modern slavery is a politically motivated attempt to look at the most egregious cases, the most extreme cases. Um, and for that, you can get broad support. Therefore, you know, Palermo is supported very broadly. But he then argues that actually it can legitimate uh, or at least deprioritize the everyday abuses of systems. So it, it avoids difficult, difficult issues about migration. It avoids difficult, difficult issues about long supply chains and, and labor abuse. Um, that's kind of one side of the argument. And, um, I was looking through um, Emily Kenway's recent book, which some of you might have come across very much kind of arguing along on those sorts of lines. And then on the other hand, the other kind of area, which is um, very interesting, I think at the moment, is this whole thing about what is the purpose of business? Um, and the British Academy doing some really interesting work about purposeful business um, uh, as part of their work on the future of the corporation, talking about, you know, business should be, solving the problems uh, of people and planet profitably, not profit from causing problems. And there's a whole range of uh, initiatives from the, the US round table to the work the Financial Reporting Council's doing on purpose. And this is kind of, you know, what a lot of uh, businesses are talking. So, so I guess that's kind of the other side of the view, which is actually um, businesses really aren't primarily about abusing people. They should really be about um, solving problems uh, profitably. So just to kind of um, set two different sort of uh, areas of, of, of contemporary thought. And so into this kind of uh, dilemma, these contested areas, what do I do? Um, and what I thought um, I'd show you is just the headlines of my four strategic objectives, which are set back in 2019. And what I've tried to do, I think, is reflect both. It's not a case of either or. As with the answer to many questions, of course, it's both, it's, it's, it's and. Uh, so of course, uh, victim uh, care and support is, is key. Um, a whole range of issues, um, particularly about long-term survival and helping people to uh, lead lives of sustainable independence, real uh, focus on, on victim uh, support, and as I say, in that move through to becoming a survivor and about law enforcement. Um, of course, and, and Samantha's absolutely right, the levels of uh, prosecutions uh, are low, and I'm just looking at figures, the latest figures available, and they've dropped uh, even more. So a real concern about, about that. But then again, I have got that focus on prevention, and in many ways, 
the work on prevention is for me the very fascinating area, whether you're talking about um, issues in terms of uh, business or consumers or what can be done upstream in countries of origin, um, real focus on trying to get a, ahead of the curve and think about what are those issues in the system uh, that are creating the environment in which modern slavery and human trafficking can flourish. Uh, and the last area which is good to be speaking about at the Bonavero is that I do th feel it's really important that we get value from, from the research and innovation. And you know, one of my uh, real concerns is while there's a lot of work going on um, in, in universities, a lot of research, loads of papers being written, the extent to which that kind of bridges into the, either the practical world of, of practitioners and practice or indeed policy and politics uh, it is, it's, it's not as good as it needs to be. And I saw somebody put in the chat the details of the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Center and clearly, you know, a key part of that is going to be about bridging uh, from the world of research into the world of policy uh, and practice, but particularly policy. So I'm hoping that I've shown you there that I've tried to sort of uh, navigate my way through uh, rights and systems. And I thought I'd uh, talk about just three um, practical examples of the sorts of things we've been doing. One uh, that's preoccupying me at the moment is the issue of the uh, role of financial institutions. Uh, and the argument, of course, that you know, we all know that slavery is illegal in every country in the world. I think Mauritania was the last country to make it illegal. But so often, economic and financial systems can appear to tolerate, uh, you know, uh, tolerate it or even kind of promulgate practices which can result in abuse. So, you know, how, how can that be? Um, and there's two sorts of areas that which we've been really working on at the moment, thinking about financial institutions in terms of their key role in detecting and disrupting illicit financial flows. I think the calculation was it's about eight years old now that um, modern slave and human trafficking is worth about $150 billion a year. I suspect it's a lot more than that because that's quite an old uh, calculation. But whether you're talking about victims or whether you're talking about offenders, you know, they use the financial system. So what is the kind of the role uh, of financial institutions to detect and disrupt those flows? Um, you know, modern slavery and human trafficking is a predicate offence for uh, money laundering. So that's one area we've been focusing on. But also the second area um, is great quotation from the Liechtenstein Initiative which talks about you know, finance being the lever by which the whole global economy can be moved. Um, you know, to what extent are those who are either investing in companies or lending to companies really uh, doing their due diligence about how these businesses are operating? Because if um, finance is not provided, uh, then of course, you know, businesses are, are not going to operate. And this whole issue about um, if businesses are tolerating uh, labor abuse you know then they have an unfair competitive advantage but also they have an unfair access to capital and that's why kind of banks and financial institutions are utterly key the last quote there um, is a reference to a report which we published um, last month in january about preventing modern slavery and human trafficking uh, an agenda for action right across the financial services sector and i've got um, a round table with about 15 bankers tomorrow afternoon going through some of these issues and it's a real kind of call to action so this is absolutely I absolutely get the point about the structure of businesses and what can be done to to, to make them um, much uh, less tolerant uh, what can be done to think about how we can uh, affect the system a, a second area um, that's kind of linked but again it's thinking about the system it's about this whole issue about brands and their responsibility for, for abuse and exploitation in supply chains. You mostly will have uh, remember maybe the coverage last summer, uh, particularly about the um, business uh, of Boohoo, where um, very much revealed because of the issues of COVID, the high levels of COVID in um, Leicester, and real concern about the terrible working conditions uh, in some of these suppliers to Boohoo. Um, Boohoo was sufficiently concerned about this that they commissioned Alison Levitt um, to do a review of what was going on. And that was published back in September. 
um, um, it's a damning indictment about what was happening in those suppliers in terms of terrible working conditions, low rates of pay, um, you know, big issues about health and safety, you know, contracts, um, largely labor abuse, no real evidence of, of, of slavery and exploitation, but widespread endemic uh, labor abuse. What was interesting um, is she said, that's all very much happening. But she also uh, concluded, and I think she's probably right, that the, the brand um, were not in any way responsible in law. There was no statute that made them accountable for those sorts of abuses. Um, there have been uh, nearly 200 uh, law enforcement operations in Leicester focused on their suppliers. Um, in our report, the modern slavery statement, which is a statutory requirement for businesses to, to, to review the risks of slavery in their supply chains and to deal with them. We had a pretty reasonable modern slavery statement and it just seemed to me that that whole issue was pretty irrelevant to what was going on. Uh, and that, that's why um, in January this year, I um, made a call with the outgoing Director of Labour Market Enforcement for what was um, called joint responsibility. It's an idea that's been around for a few years, but the suggestion is that brands should be made uh, jointly responsible for those poor working conditions. And if and when um, there is evidence they are happening in suppliers, then they're given a, a certain period of time to work with the suppliers to address them and to deal with them. And if they don't, uh, then they are um, publicly named. Um, for all sorts of reasons, I think that's probably a better solution than going straight in to something like criminal liability, but happy to have, have that discussion. So again, um, again, I hopefully this is an example of trying to navigate through the system, think about prevention, because I, I, from all my experience, the line between slavery and trafficking and labor abuse is a very fuzzy, fuzzy line. And so I think we've got to think about the broader issues of labor abuse. We can't just go for the, uh, pick off the egregious uh, exceptional issues. And lastly, um, one of the other really tricky issues is what I call trafficking versus people smuggling. Um, and this, I think, is a, probably a growing concern of mine. Um, of course, what tends to happen is if somebody is trafficked, then they're seen as a victim and the Modern Slavery Act would apply. Um, if somebody is smuggled, that's an offence against the state. And of course, the person who is smuggled is committing an offence under the Immigration Act, I think Section 25 of the Immigration Act. So, you know, it's a very grave deal of difference about the way these two things um, are seen in law. Of course, the reality for many victims is that they can be blurred when people set off on journeys, uh, you know, wanting to get a, make a better life for themselves and their family. They might um, you know, consent to be uh, smuggled. That's, you know, that's what they see the arrangement as, but actually on their journeys, um, they can often be trafficked. And certainly when they're getting to the UK, are very often in debt bondage and in positions of exploitation. So frequently blurred for victims. And we did some recent work with the National Crime Agency looking at um, Vietnamese journeys. And again, you know, strong evidence of, of that blurring for many people. Uh, and again, organised crime groups, um, they will move from one uh, sort of criminality to, to the other. So for them, it's an indistinct uh, uh, division. Of course, the reason why this matters is that what concerns me is the real risk that law enforcement agencies, be they police forces or the National Crime Agency or border force or immigration enforcement, you know, don't consistently think about are people victims and they, the, the risk is that people are all uh, seen as um, uh, offenders, that they are seen as uh, people who are smuggling and should be arrested. So one of my real concerns at the moment is to ensure that there is a consistent approach to uh, prioritizing support for victims and thinking about that uh, right, right at the beginning. And then and the second point absolutely applies to border and immigration. And, there has been some real concern this uh, last year, partly because of COVID systems for identifying victims were uh, curtailed or shortened uh, by um, the UK visas and immigration uh, people. Um, 
they were forced because of litigation to put those questions back, but it was just another example where um, that focus on identifying victims was so easily lost. Uh, and I'm kind of real concerned about that. So it's again, it's a very difficult area. What I'm trying to do all the time is saying we must be asking the questions. We must be making sure people have good advice, that they have access to, to legal assistance, uh, and that we're able to ensure that those uh, who have been trafficked uh, are, are supported in the right way. And on that, Samantha, I'm going to finish and stop sharing my screen. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah, so much for the, that very succinct um, um, overview of your role. I mean, what a, an incredibly complex role you have as well. And I want to come back um, in the questions um, on the hostile environment and on the structural economic issue and also um, on what um, more regulation we need around um, businesses. And I can see we've got um, some questions on that already and please do um, put your questions um, in the box. But let's turn now um, to Siddharth Kara, um, who um, is going to talk more about the, um, the international side. So um, Siddharth, um, you've researched, you've written extensively about modern slavery um, and your current research is focused on conditions in cobalt mining in the Congo. Um, and um, you've got a new book which will come out uh, next year on that. So um, over to you and um, thank you. Terrific, thank you so much, Samantha. I'm really pleased to be with all of you this evening. Um, I've been asked to talk about modern slavery for about 15 minutes, which is a great challenge for me. Um, ideally, I would have much more time to give you an overview. Uh, so forgive me, I'm going to move through some slides um, rather briskly, sort of as an information uh, dump, uh, as it were, and I look forward to then having a, a fruitful Q&A session. Um, so let's just frame things historically. I know you've had some sessions on uh, historical slavery, but I think spending a moment here will be fruitful for us uh, as we move into an overview of modern slavery. Slavery uh, is, of course, a practice that dates back millennia all the way to historic hunting societies. Uh, it, in, it basically involves owning and exploiting a person like their property, hence the term chattel, chattel slavery. Now, slaves have always historically been considered inferior, by inherently inferior to the people who owned them. And the lines between owner and owned, slave and slave owner, were immutable and strictly enforced by law, culture, and religion. Slaves could not uh, exit the condition unless they were granted freedom by the person who owned them, or if they perished, and the first definition uh, of slavery in uh, international law came from a League of Nations slavery convention in 1926, which in essence says exerting power over someone, controlling them as if they are your property. Um, we're all familiar with this, the old world sort of Atlantic slave trade, also called the triangular uh, trade. Um, this is the prototypical uh, manifestation of slavery in the old world. Um, by way of general summary, for three and a half centuries, Western Europeans uh, traveled south uh, to the west coast of Africa, um, carted off over 12 million Africans across the Atlantic and sold them into slavery uh, in the Americas. Uh, two thirds of them were sold into sugar plantations in the West Indies. And uh, sugar harvesting at that time is probably one of the most hellish and horrific modes of slavery uh, in human history. There were economic considerations, and this is important for understanding modern slavery as well, economic considerations at every step in the process. What goods are brought south uh, because they're in demand to be sold in West Africa? How long does a ship captain spend trolling the coast trying to fill his ship? The more slaves he gets, the more money he makes on the other end, but the longer he spends, more people die because of disease and so forth. When do you cross the Atlantic? In the winter, there are storms, so the crossing can be more perilous, but if you arrive at the other end, it's harvest time and slaves can be sold for more. Conversely, summer is more smooth, but lower cost uh, uh, sales price of slaves at the other end. At its peak, England ran about half of the Atlantic slave trade. As you all know, slavery was abolished in England in 1833, in the US in 1865, and that sort of brought an end to this old world manifestation of the Atlantic slave trade, yet the harmful legacies persist to this day. So then what is modern slavery with that fast action summary of old world slavery? Well, you can't legally own people anymore, right? You haven't been able to do that for quite some time. And there are legal definitions in statutes and the like 
Um, Sarah spoke about some of those, Samantha spoke about some of those, but in essence, modern slavery refers to an array of severely exploitative labor practices that amount to treating people like property. Uh, Samantha mentioned the Forced Labor Convention, that's ILO Convention 29. Uh, look it up, that's a very important thing. Um, for you to be aware of in terms of what forced labor is, human trafficking, as was mentioned, comes out of the Palermo Protocol. Another big, big bucket, possibly the biggest bucket of what contributes to modern slavery is debt bondage. And that, in, in essence, is the exchange of credit for labor between two parties with high, highly asymmetric access to rights, capital, resources, and so forth. It comes from the old world feudal economies. Someone uh, who is poor, needs a loan, needs credit, needs a place to live, that is advanced to them, but it has to be worked off. And you can imagine how the terms of working it off can be manipulated so that in essence, you're getting servile labor as a result. Now, there's some important questions about modern slavery. What about prison labor? What about forced marriage? Or something we call the worst forms of child labor, uh, ILO Convention 182, which you should also look up. Uh, in a longer discussion, we'd sort of tease some of these out, but there's important debates about is, is prison labor modern slavery? Uh, is forced marriage modern slavery? Uh, very interesting uh, and important uh, theoretical discussions that the field is having at present. What's the scale of modern slavery? Hard to calculate, but somewhere between 30 and 45 million slaves in the world today. Uh, as Samantha mentioned, the ILO estimates that they generate profits in excess of $150 billion a year. What I'd add to that is that's profits to their immediate exploiters. Everything they're producing flows up the chain and ultimately has much more value at the very top. So the child making the garment in the, the factory or, or, or in India, you calculate the profit of exploiting them on the wholesale price of that shirt. But when it's sold at the high street in, in London, it's another matter altogether. So that's another thing in terms of what is the value of slave exploitation today? Huge range, depending on the type of slavery. An agricultural slave in South Asia may generate profits for their exploiter of a few hundred dollars per year. And someone trafficked for commercial sexual exploitation in uh, Western developed economies could generate profits that exceed $150,000 per year. Modern slavery, unlike the old world, has a wider range of exploitation. In the old world, we're talking about agriculture, construction, domestic work, and of course, there was sexual exploitation. In the modern age, there are dozens of sectors in which slaves will be exploited. Commercial sex, of course, an array of manufacturing um, uh, sectors, apparel and textiles, tea, coffee, palm oil plantations, the mining of rare earth and common metals, uh, uh, minerals, gemstones, diamonds all range of agricultural products, fishing and aquaculture, and of course, domestic servitude. And most of these sectors feed goods and profits into the global economy. Who are the slaves in the world today? Well, they are by, by definition and almost always poor. And 40% of the people in this world live on incomes of less than a latte a day. So three, four pounds a day. Um, almost half the planet. So you have a huge swath of people who are vulnerable due to poverty. So modern slaves are often migrants or displaced people, which makes them vulnerable to being recruited or trafficked into exploitation. They suffer economic disenfranchisement and they lack reliable sources of income or access to formal credit markets. They may live in areas that are politically unstable, where there's corruption, military conflict, or even environmental catastrophe, which displaces them. Bias against female gender and minority ethnicities are powerful forces on the supply side that push people into servile and slave labor exploitation, make them vulnerable to being exploited. Many of these are the forces that have promoted a supply of potential slaves throughout history. What's crucial to understand in terms of modern slavery is the demand side. Now we agreed long ago slavery was not acceptable, yet slavery exists and permeates the global economy. Why is that? Why is there still demand for slave labor? Well, the specific forces of demand from one industry to another will vary, but there are always two forces, two forces that are consistent and they're economic forces. One is the exploiters demand to maximize profit and our demand, yours and mine, our demand for cheap things. What do I mean by this? For any business, 
this. Labor is almost always the highest cost component of operating expenses. So throughout history, producers have tried to find ways to minimize labor costs. Slavery is the extreme, virtually nil cost of labor. When you reduce labor costs, the operating costs of your business are reduced and that allows you to boost or maximize profit. Substantially lower labor costs also allow you to do one other thing, be more price competitive by lowering the price of what you're selling. Now that element is the main difference between the old world slavery that I talked about in brief and modern slavery, the globalization of competition. So in a globalized economy where products are available to us in our shops here from all over the world, the need to be price competitive against all producers everywhere is greater than ever. So slavery and other forms of severe labor exploitation, child labor, uh, penny wage labor, they've evolved from the old world into a globalized world as, they, as a primary way in which unscrupulous producers will compete to maximize profits and price competitiveness. That gets us to this topic of global supply chains, right? All of these are goods feeding into the global economy. So the rise of the globalized economy and the freer flow of goods and capital and people has yielded many benefits, but it has also led to the rise of various modes of severe labor exploitation in the shadows of our global economy. And we generally don't know exactly how much and in, the, in what ways these modes of exploitation exist from one commodity or product to the next, and they range from low wage sweatshop type labor, underregulated labor markets, child labor to outright slavery. And it's for the same reason of minimizing the cost of inputs and labor to balance the twin imperatives of boosting profitability and price competitiveness. Words are one thing, pictures always tell us so much more. So I'm gonna walk you through a, a few images of actual modern slaves in the world today at the bottom of global supply chains. These people are um, uh, uh, slaves in old, old world tea plantations uh, that the British set up during colonial times in South Asia. This is in uh, modern day Bangladesh, the old Bengal area. And, and generations ago, one and a half, two centuries ago, peasants were brought from what would be today Charkand and Odisha into tea plantation work, often in indentured servitude. And what was remarkable when I conducted interviews is all the people who were there when I met them some years ago, could trace their ancestry back to that period when people were first brought over from Charkand and Odisha during the colonial period. There's still a captive population of individuals harvesting tea in forced labor conditions, isolated, uh, uh, largely almost imprisoned in tea plant. Now the difference is this tea flows up into the global economy all around the world. They work to the bone to the point of dropping onto a pile of tea leaves to get a, a few short winks before having to work again. This person I documented a couple of years ago, this is in Northern India. She is working in the home with her daughter, who's not in this image, um, making garments that are sold for major apparel brands in the West. Um, she works for about 10 or 11 cents per hour. Her daughter does not go to school. She also works. Uh, they are also in a condition of debt bondage. They have to take a, take a loan for food and, 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 and supplies. Uh, and all of this uh, cheap garment labor flows right up to um, uh, major brands uh, in the West. Uh, this big mountain you see here is something called trash fish. This is a boat in Thailand. Um, the, the story here is trash fish are used uh, in an array of purposes that flow into the global economy. First, they're used to create food for shrimp farms. Thailand is the number two shrimp exporter in the world. Um, uh, and the EU and US are the dominant buyers. Uh, trash fish are also used for uh, animal feed, so it goes into beef uh, be uh, supply for cows and chickens, and it's also used for pet food. Now, why is this an issue? Well, the people I met and documented here in Thailand, they're largely uh, individuals trafficked from surrounding Mekong subregion countries, Cambodia, Cambodia and Laos, uh, Myanmar. They're trafficked in, sold to ship captains for somewhere between six to $900, and then they spend months at sea, isolated where they may be tortured, beaten, worked to the bone. Many times they're killed and thrown overboard rather than be paid. So this is how you get the $10 or 10 pound all you can eat shrimp buffet. You just strip out the cost of labor. Uh, and this is the bottom again of one of the, not just the shrimp supply chain, but beef, chicken, and even pet food. 
Uh, this is the last one I'll show you here, the Central Valley of California. There are people brought in on guest worker visas or there are irregular migrants. In either case, they uh, 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 debt of working off the cost of either arranging their visa or their transport across the country. Um, and, and then once they're here, they may be uh, isolated, they're exploited, uh, they don't have the ability to leave the farm, they work off this supposed debt uh, in forced labor conditions. The Central Valley of California is the largest productive agricultural zone in the world. Uh, so your salad at your table, along with the shrimp and the shirt you're wearing and the tea afterwards, the, those just four slides tell us uh, how much of our daily lives is touched by uh, slavery at the bottom of global supply chains. I'll end now going into a deeper case study. As Samantha mentioned, my next book is going to be on cobalt uh, mining in the Congo. Uh, I've been traveling there uh, the last few years, uh, and, and this is I would say the most extreme manifestation of modern slavery I've, I've documented in 21 years of research. So what's the story here? Every lithium ion rechargeable battery in the world at present has cobalt in it. So every smartphone, every tablet, every laptop, and more importantly, every rechargeable vehicle, every electric vehicle that's being made and will be made in the future has cobalt in it. Now, more than 70% of the world's supply of cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There are two sources, industrial mines and what are called artisanal mines. Don't be fooled by that name that it's sort of some quaint, you know, artisan work. Um, uh, this is peasant child labor in brutish conditions. Um, um, and, and there's a line is drawn between these two categories, but one driving theme you have to understand about slavery and supply chains is all these lines are blurry just as the definitional lines are blurry, as Sarah mentioned, between smuggling and trafficking. All these lines are, are, are blurred. There's somewhere between 35 and 60,000 children uh, working in an artisanal cobalt mining in the Congo, a couple of hundred thousand adults, and the conditions are characterized by acute human and environmental destruction at the bottom of the chain. And at the top, there are titanic tech empires worth trillions of dollars. So where is the cobalt? If you look at those two little provinces in, this, in the southeastern corner of the Congo, Lualaba and Hotkatanga, that's an area called the Copper Belt. Um, co cobalt is always found bound to copper and nickel in nature, and that's where the cobalt is. It's the largest known deposit anywhere in the world and also among the highest grade, mean the, meaning the most pure cobalt. Uh, mining sites uh, are highly secure, they are militarized, and there's always and often violence in many of these mining areas. Um, this is what the supply chain looks like. I won't spend too much time pulling you through the tedium of it. The upshot here is it's messy and it's opaque. And that is in some sense almost by design and is relied upon by stakeholders to say, well, you know, maybe it's not our fault because it's some it's the responsibility of someone else down the chain. So the upstream part here that takes place in the Congo, this red part is what's informal, the artisanal mining part. And the blue is sort of the formal part. Now, artisanal mines, the cobalt is sold to traders, ultimately to depots, and then it meets up with industrial formal production at the processing stage. These little asterisks tell you the points at which cobalt from all kinds of sources is mixed together. Once it's all here, you cannot differentiate what came from where. It's smelted, mixed together, and then flows up the chain to uh, be refined to battery grade form, and then into battery manufacturers, and then into car and tech companies. The point is, many global supply chains are like this. They're very messy at the bottom, and that messiness serves as an, an almost a vehicle to exculpate people who are relying on that messiness at the very top, to, to shift responsibility downstream. Pictures, again, tell so much more than words can. This is what the average artisanal cobalt mining site in, in the Congo looks like. You will see children here digging, covered in cake and filth uh, in this craterous landscape, gathering um, cobalt uh, in, in the form of a stone called heterogenite, uh, which is co cobalt, copper, and nickel. They gather the stone here, use a mallet. You can see it in this guy's hand to break it down into smaller pieces that are then rinsed. 
This is a rinsing pool. It's a toxic, putrid, hazardous body of water. Children go in there, they pick up this little sieve, which I'm pointing to here, and they sieve the water like panning for gold. You've seen those images. They separate stone from dirt um, to have just the cobalt, the heterogeneite pebbles on top, which they then load into a bucket. This water is filled with all manner of toxic and hazardous material. Cobalt often also has uranium, uh, the heterogeneite stone. So many of these bodies of water actually are mildly radioactive as well. The most dangerous part of cobalt mining is the tunnel, the tunnel digging. Uh, this is in an area, a neighborhood uh, outside of a town called Kolwezi, which is the heart of cobalt mining in the Congo. Um, uh, the, the deeper you go, there are higher grade, uh, larger uh, deposits. So young men and boys uh, will dig these deep tunnels down. They could be up to 30, 40 meters deep. They don't have any supports. There are no rock bolts. There are no ventilation shafts. They climb down using their hands and feet down the shaft, um, uh, spend up to a day at a time uh, down there, often taking short naps. It's difficult to breathe. Uh, the particulate matter is very hazardous and these tunnels collapse. They collapse regularly. And no one wants to admit it or talk about it, but they collapse regularly. And everyone who's down there at the time is buried alive. There are children all over the mining areas, all over the provinces. There are babies with babies all across the cobalt mining sector. This is an area north of a town called Kambov. It was guarded by militia. This is probably the closest I ever got to being shot while I was in the Congo. Uh, these are young girls uh, with their babies taking a break from digging in a, a little pit in a trench there, gathering cobalt. Just by reminder, all of this flows up to our smartphones and tablets. Don't let anyone ever tell you this cobalt is not ending up in the formal supply chain. And here's what a big site looks like. This was actually a neighborhood at one point. Someone found a big chunk of cobalt here, uh, a big deposit of cobalt, I should say. All the homes were bulldozed, all the cheese were chopped down, all the people were displaced, and a formal operation was set up with uh, elite Republican guard securing this site. All those pink tarps you see are the site of a tunnel. Tunnel digging happens, they go down, dig out the stones, and of course it flows up into the formal supply chain. Uh, this is what a sort of larger uh, mining area would look like in, in the Congo. Last thing I wanna say, and then I'll end my remarks, is there is a very strong relationship between slavery and environment. And oftentimes, it's not just the people at the bottom of the chain who are treated in a subhuman uh, or inferior way, it's also their physical environment is treated in a way we would not treat our own environment here. And in particular with cobalt, which is driving the renewable revolution and the green economy. Well, it's built not just on the blood of the Congolese people, but also the destruction of their environment. So this is a small village called Kapata. It's just outside of Kolwezi. My colleagues at uh, uh, the Wrights Lab at Nottingham have some uh, fabulous satellite images they can access. So they sh we got this image from 2014. And what you'll see here is the small village, okay? Some green space, a body of water here. And there was an old sort of defunct copper mine nearby, uh, nearby this village. Now, at this point, cobalt had not exploded. So let's move five years later. Okay, this is what Kapata looks like in 2019. You see the village has grown substantially. Every one of these little black dots you see is a tunnel. There are hundreds of tunnels. That body of water is gone. That mine has exploded in size because now cobalt is valuable. And so a formal operation exists right beneath this village, which is filled with children. And these are the little depots where the artisanal miners sell their cobalt and the depots sell it to this formal mine here, which is owned by a Chinese company. And they send all that supply to mainland China to be smelted and then from there to major tech and EV and car companies. But just take a look at the environmental destruction in just a few short years. This leads to what I will call my central thesis of modern slavery, and I'll end with this. Modern slavery involves the violent transformation of the coerced labor and services of a global subclass of humanity into the delightful items we consume every day. Thank you so much.
Sadar, thank you so much. So we definitely need to talk more about um, the global economy and neoliberalism. Um, but I also am really glad that you raised the issue of the environment and maybe we can talk a bit um, in, in a moment about the connection between this whole sort of move towards net zero and all of the um, science and economics that are going into that and what impact that will have and whether that can also be used to think about solutions um, for slavery and trafficking. But before we go to questions, um, we are going to turn to Kate Garbers and look at the, um, at the, at the domestic sphere again. And I wanted to just preface um, that by saying that in the UK, at least, in terms of nationalities that are um, identified as victims of trafficking or slavery, the top three are Albania, Vietnam and British. And that really surprises people. And my clients reflect that, that um, absolutely, I have British clients, I have EE, um, a national clients and I have um, clients um, from the rest of the world. So it isn't just something uh, which is affecting um, victims or survivors somewhere else um, far away from the UK. It's affecting um, people who've got settled status um, in the UK. So Kate, let's turn to you. Kate set up a charity working directly with um, those who are exploited seeking to assist them in a holistic way, recognising the gaps in the system set up by the government. And Kate also developed the Anti-Slavery Partnership, bringing together partners and agencies across the sector. So Kate, um, I think you're going to talk to us about um, why you found it unseen, why there was a need to um, have um, such an organisation and the kind of work that you were doing there. Over to you. Great, thanks Sam. Um, I'm afraid you're going to have to look at my face for about 10 minutes, I don't have any slides, um, but you will see my hands moving around, so that hopefully will keep people entertained. Um, so as Sam said, um, I have spent the last 12 years of my life working operationally in the anti-slavery sector, helping to lead an organisation called Unseen. Um, I left the organisation towards the end of last year, but tonight I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of the last 12 years of working in the sector, how it came about, and then what you guys as members of the public can potentially do um, around this issue as well. So I am still working in the sector and doing research with a couple of universities. Um, I'm also trying to uh, write a book about my experiences um, and trying to tell people about um, the privilege that I have had in terms of the people I have met um, over the last 12 years. I feel really strongly that the experiences that people that I have met have had need to be shared and until survivors across the board are in a position to do this for themselves. Um, this is kind of me trying to, to give a little contribution back in terms of raising awareness of some of the issues and things that I have seen people experience. Um, I also work with legal teams on potential modern slavery cases, and I am an ambassador for Unseen Still and hugely supportive um, of the work the organisation is continuing. So I got involved um, nearly 13 years ago now in this um, area of work. I learned about trafficking when I was working in a Ukrainian orphanage. I was going out in my summer holidays and volunteering. And um, I asked the question um, of the orphanage staff, what happened to the children when they came to leave the orphanage? And I learned that there would be people waiting at the orphanage gates to offer the children that I had hung out with and played with and become incredibly fond of. They would be waiting there to offer them jobs and to promise them um, the opportunity of travel or work and all the things that a child leaving an orphanage with no kind of um, community, no structure um, and no one to kind of turn to would be needing. And what would often transpire for these children was that actually that promise of a job would potentially um, equate to being forced into prostitution or into a life of crime. And this really um, struck me that we were working with these children um, while they were at the orphanage, but not then really able to do anything at the point when they were, they were coming to leave. And as part of this, I also spent some time um, speaking with the children and I met um, one child who told me his story 
and he expressed to me that he had viewed his mother being kidnapped in front of him, kind of bundled into a car and, and taken away. And then he had been dropped off at the orphanage. And I found that to be quite disturbing. What I didn't link um, was what the translator then filled in for me afterwards. And the translator believed that what happened in that situation was that the mother had been taken and would have been forced into the sex industry. And this was something that was happening in Ukraine at the time that people were just being taken off the streets and forced into selling sex. And he had then ended up at the orphanage. And this really stuck with me. Um, and I spoke to a friend about it um, and kind of what, what were we going to do? And we decided um, that we were going to, to do something. So I was a primary school teacher at the time and we decided that I would quit my job. Um, and I then spent two years voluntarily kind of trying to understand slavery um, or trafficking, as it was known then. So this is all pre the Modern Slavery Act and pre terminology of slavery. Um, and I was trying to understand what the issues were, how the children that I had worked with were being impacted. Um, was it just an issue in Ukraine? Was it an issue elsewhere? And I think at the time, just learning that this issue was far bigger and far darker than I could ever have imagined. Um, and I think this is a thread that has kind of continued throughout my career. I think you, you think you grasp it and you think you finally understand it and you think you've heard of kind of every possible way that a human would use another human or exploit them or offer them an opportunity for it not to come to fruition. And I think continuously kind of in the sector, you just learn that there are always different ways that people kind of exploit each other. Then it is this kind of crazy, always developing phenomena um, that, that you have to kind of keep on top of because it's always, always changing and always morphing. So I spent two years speaking to people and trying to learn what the gaps were, what was needed. And at the time, um, there was one other organization that was providing um, support to survivors and um, very much police, um, government officials and the charity sector were saying we need more support for um, people who are identified as potential victims. So to cut a, a long story short, um, we decided that we would establish Unseen and we established the organisation in 2008. To achieve, um, to achieve three main things. We wanted to support people. So we wanted to offer direct survivor support services to assist those who had been exploited. We then also wanted to equip people. So we wanted to train healthcare workers, the police, frontline agencies, businesses. We wanted to give people training, advice and resources so that they could tackle the issue and better identify and support potential victims and survivors in their kind of arena. We also then wanted to influence. So we um, have worked really hard over the years in trying to influence government, society, legislation, policy. And that goes from everything from working behind the scenes with ministers to raising modern slavery issues in the media. And um, so a bit of a, a whistle stop tour, I suppose, of then what we actually did. So we, as I said, it took two years for us to work out what um, we needed to do and what a safe house could look like. So primary school teacher to establishing a safe house um, and running a charity, we had to learn quite a lot quite quickly. Um, we often say that it was kind of a bit of a, a rocket launching experience that we just had to kind of buckle up and hold on and, uh, and learn as we go. Um, but we set up the first safe house for women uh, in 2010. Um, we then, um, as Sam mentioned, realised that we couldn't do this in isolation and actually we needed um, other agencies to be on board if we were actually going to understand the issue and tackle it. And we created the Anti-Trafficking Partnership, as it was then known, in 2011. And this was about bringing other agencies on board. So this, again, was pre the Modern Slavery Act and at a stage where we were still having to convince people that trafficking was a thing and that trafficking was actually occurring. And the partnership brought together statutory agencies, faith communities, um, health and legal practitioners and NGOs. And the idea originally was to try and build an accurate picture and then to try and tackle slavery and trafficking in the city. So that was the city of Bristol, which is where um, Unseen is based. Then roll on to 2012, uh, we realized that women who were leaving the safe house uh, were then settling in the community. 
and that actually as part of that they were still um, isolated so they would kind of had their initial support in a safe house setting and then moved on into accommodation but actually um, needed help and support to integrate into communities so we set up a resettlement service in 2012 to make sure that people were moving on were able to uh, not be isolated and to integrate then in 2015 we realized that the anti-trafficking partnership and we've now kind of got them on the Slavery Act, so it became the Anti-Slavery Partnership. Um, and we realised that it was all well and good having a city focus, but actually we needed to move to a regional focus. And this was kind of the understanding for us and the other agencies and our learning and our growing in this area was that the understanding that slavery and trafficking didn't respect or stay within the barriers that we artificially put in place. So actually across the Southwest, different things were happening and different police forces were involved and different agencies were involved, but it may have been the same kind of gangs and the same people that were involved in the exploitation. So we needed to have a, a regional response to this. So we then set up um, anti-slavery partnership boards in Devon and Cornwall, Wiltshire, Avon and Somerset, Gloucestershire and Dorset. So everybody had their own local board that then fill, um, kind of understood the local issues, but then filtered up into an overarching regional board. And that just meant that you could have kind of an oversight of what was happening and the agencies that had a regional remit could understand what was happening across the whole region. But also it didn't prevent locally kind of based responses happening and responding in the moment. And that um, is still going and provides a really good resource for everyone that's on the ground and the region to kind of work together as we uh, try and tackle the issue. We then 2016, um, and this is, sounds ridiculous to say now, um, but at, at the time kind of prior to 2015 probably um, very much the media and the rhetoric was all based in sexual exploitation and was all based um, around women and girls um, and you've heard the Paloma protocol mentioned earlier um, that is how the Paloma protocol is positioned it is about the exploitation for women and girls and um, we realized that actually this was an issue specifically in forced labor but also related to men and that men were also being impacted um, and in 2016, we opened a safe house for men as well. The same year, we also um, opened the Modern Slavery Helpline, um, so a 24-7 resource for any frontline professional, any member of the public, um, any business to um, either report concerns of modern slavery or to call to get kind of assistance and help with um, if they think slavery may be occurring. We then also um, piloted a, the first Ofsted Children's, um, sorry, Ofsted Registered Children's Care Home. Um, in 2018, we worked with government um, to pilot a new model to see whether we could reduce the number of trafficked children that were going missing from care. Um, there was a real and continues to be a real concern that trafficked children once identified um, are often going missing with about 72 hours of being placed in a care setting. So we worked with um, government and with Ofsted, local um, authorities and policing to see if we could work out um, a model that would protect children that were referred um, for, for, for being um, potentially trafficked. Um, we also then have been working directly with businesses and via the Modern Slavery Helpline have launched um, kind of direct assistant packages to businesses um, via a back to source program that was launched last year. So at the same time of doing all of these bits, uh, we have been delivering training to frontline professionals, working with police on operational activity, sitting on various government led stakeholder boards, working with businesses to look at transparency in their supply chains. Um, and the Unseen CEO was involved in um, a Centre for Social Justice report called It Happens Here, which was used as then one of the catalysts to start considering the Modern Slavery Act. Um, I think what we've always said at Unseen is we wanted to use what was learned at the front line to then influence what happens. And some of my favourite reflections for working with the organisation were when home office officials would come down and people would be offered the opportunity to speak to them and to tell them directly kind of what was good with the system, what wasn't so good with the system um, and kind of what they would like to see change and just that kind of ability to, you know, all the systems we have look great on paper but actually to hear survivor voices being able to kind of tell the guys and girls at Whitehall what needs to change and what needs to be different and what they needed um, was a really kind of powerful experience to, to be part of. 
So um, just to highlight, I wasn't sure if any of the other speakers were going to do this. So I thought it might also just be good to clarify kind of the situation of slavery in the UK currently. So in 2019, over 10,000 people in the UK were identified as potential victims of modern slavery. Um, over half of these people were exploited as adults, um, and the main type of exploitation was for forced labour or labour exploitation. As Sam mentioned earlier, the top three countries that um, survivors were identified from were the UK, Albania and Vietnam. Now, we haven't got the stats yet for 2020, but we do have three quarters worth of data. And in those three quarters from last year, we see that 7,500 victims were identified. And now that is quite a lot considering for the majority of the year, we were in lockdown last year. Um, and I know that charities and organizations working in the sector are really concerned about what happens to people um, who were potentially being exploited and forced to do things um, during lockdown if they weren't able to be identified. Um, so the latest stats show us from those three quarters that um, there were 7,500 potential victims identified. Again, I think has been mentioned by other previous speakers, um, numbers uh, we could say that's the tip of the iceberg, there may have been more, we're not sure what the impact of COVID was, um, and I think generally data collection is a really, really tricky area in this topic. Um, the types of slavery, I know tonight's focused on forced labour, but the UK um, under the national referral mechanism, which is the system that Sam mentioned earlier, also has the category servitude, sexual exploitation, criminal exploitation, organ harvesting, and forced labour. And those are the kind of five types of slavery that are seen in the UK um, and identified. Um, again, just to clarify, this impacts men, women and children. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, it's a really complex and ever morphing phenomenon. Um, via the stories and the work that I did at Unseen with legal teams, law enforcement, I have seen met and heard stories from people who have been forced to work in the following sectors. Um, so I thought it'd be useful to share the kind of sectors that we have seen uh, people being exploited in. So it's been the agriculture sector, the service industry, I guess by that I mean restaurants, hospitality, sex industry, the beauty industry. We've also seen cases in construction, food processing and packaging. Um, and then some people are also forced into criminal acts, so drug cultivation and carrying drugs, um, and there is an increasing phenomenon of county lines happening. Um, I thought if I have time, Sam, it would be good just to share a story of um, kind of some of the people that I have met. Um, and I've got two stories, one of a lady I met on a welfare visit, um, which was with the Anti-Slavery Partnership. We used to do some welfare visits as multi-agency organisations. Um, and one of them, we visited a private household where um, the police believed that there was someone who may be being forced to sell sex living there. Um, when we arrived, it was really clear that the woman didn't want to be doing what she was doing. Um, and she said that she would like to leave with us. She said that she had been promised a job um, in the UK and told that her travel, her visas and her documents would all be sorted out for her. Um, and she needed to pay a fee to come here. She didn't know at the time, but by accepting help for her travel, she then accrued a debt that she was expected to pay off upon entry and upon arrival to the UK. And um, she was going to leave with us. So we'd had a conversation about the NRM. We had a conversation about support that was on offer. And she was seriously considering that this is something that she wanted to kind of leave. She didn't want to be doing this anymore um, until she realized that we weren't in the position to pay off her debt. And she then said that for her leaving her situation, even if it's what she wanted to do, she believed would put her family uh, especially her parents and her son at risk and these were the very people that she wanted to support she had taken this job in order to send money home and actually by her leaving she believed that they would be at risk because the people that brought her here and were controlling where she lived and the clients that she saw knew where her family lived and at that point she decided that the risk for her was too big um, 
Another person I met um, was a guy called Jason. Um, I have changed oh, sorry, the names. Can I, so, um, can, I, yes. can I just jump in? Because I'm very conscious of time. I'm wondering, can I, can I just pause you there and just mm. go to some of the questions um, in the last 20 minutes? Is that all right? And I'd just mm -hmm. like to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers because I mean we have overrun a bit but you know we've got such incredibly different perspectives from people who really are working at the heart of these um, issues but um, what I want to come back to um, if, um, if um, Sarah and Siddharth do you want to put your uh, videos um, back on um, we've got a, a, a bunch of questions um, relating to the global economy um, and to section 54 um, and supply chains. And so a question from, um, I'm sorry, um, I don't know, it's F. Gooch that has um, popped up on, on, on my screen, but what role does um, Dame Sarah see for setting up a regulator for the garment sector? This is the reference to um, Boohoo, equivalent to the groceries code adjudicator. And, and then also a question, um, I think, um, Sarah, this is also one for you about um, what well, um, this is from Usman Malik. Section 54 of the Modern Slavery um, Act is not enough. Would company law reforms to directors' duties help empower Section 54? You know, how can we um, get the boardrooms of parent companies to be held accountable? So, why don't I leave those two for you, um, Sarah? Then I will. Then um, we'll direct some questions to Siddharth and to Kate as well. Thanks. So section 54 was always regarded as the sort of the first step on the uh, ladder here. Um, and it was groundbreaking at the time, but it's now looking quite sort of um, modest and cautious. The government have announced some uh, amendments to it. So making the sections mandatory, um, the Foreign Secretary announced that instead of having a power to injunct, there might be fines for companies that fail to do it. Um, and also um, they want to uh, create the requirement for registry. My own view is apart from the fact that I'm not quite sure when there's gonna be timetable for that legislation. And I don't think it's going to be this year. My concerns really are that it doesn't go far enough. So there are lots of different ideas. And I think it's Fiona Gooch who has sent that question because she's also um, contacted my office. Um, there are lots of different ideas around um, from mandatory human rights due diligence following the sort of European model which has been consulted on to um, much uh, tougher in terms of criminal liability similar to section 7 of the bribery act there's another idea um, the grocery adjudicator model which is what Fiona's talking about um, for the apparel sector my own view is that um, while the grocery adjudicator has regulated relationships to a certain extent, I don't think uh, it has dealt with the supply chain issues uh, in uh, supermarkets. So I, it's not a bad thing, but I'm not sure it's the best model. My own preference for, you know, there's probably about six or seven models we've looked at. The two that I'm interested in, one is the joint responsibility, which I mentioned um, earlier on, which is a, an approach that David Metcalf, when he was Director of Labour Market Enforcement, called for a few years ago. The other one, which I've just been discussing this afternoon with a wide range of people, is the US approach to withhold release orders, sometimes known as hot goods. You might have seen that the US response to the Xinjiang issue in January was to put a withhold release order on all goods, uh, all tomatoes and cotton from that area, but they've used it against uh, Malaysian palm um, uh, oil companies last year and against Malaysian uh, rubber companies in terms of PPE. I think that is a, an interesting way to complement um, reporting requirements that we've got. Um, the one thing I will say about reporting requirements is that, um, you know, they were the, a good step in the right direction don't go far enough. But the really frustrating thing is, the legislation actually has the ability for the Home Secretary to injunct companies that don't do it. That power has never been used. So I find it ironic we're talking about finding companies when we haven't even used the powers that are currently there. So um, lots more to be done, lots of different ideas. But I think the one thing that strikes me is that we've got to think about approaches which encourage 
intelligent sharing, which encourage people to accept a lot of the points that uh, Siddharth was making, that you know, a lot of this stuff is endemic in supply chains. And we want to, to work with suppliers to make things better, rather than them just cutting off suppliers the first sign of trouble. Uh, and we just want to come from a position where we know it is really problematic um, and there are no easy solutions, but let's try and shift the whole thing uh, in, in the right direction. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of questions um, for Sadaf. Um, one from Lawrence Luskarton, um, very good question about um, what are the major companies and financial institutions um, who are involved in the situation in Congo? Of those headquartered in Western states, have there been political or legal campaigns to highlight the responsibility for the um, abuses? And of course, in both in the UK and the US, there have been of class actions brought. I was involved in a, in a class action um, to do with gold mining in um, in Tanzania a few years ago. So that's one question. And, an, and, a, and another question, I think, um, Siddharth, which um, you could tackle, Laura Edwards says, you know, can international law grapple with such a pervasive and insidious problem um, as modern slavery? Um, do you want to have a go at those? Sure. Well, um, the, 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 the companies involved in the cobalt supply chain, the, the companies at the top are uh, all the big names whose products we use and will be using every day. So as I said, you, you can't have a rechargeable battery that avoids Congolese cobalt. At least 70% of the supply comes from the Congo. So there's not enough other cobalt anywhere. So specific names, um, and, and many of this, much of this is actually in public documentation in terms of supply chain suppliers. Um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Tesla, Ford, General Motors, BMW, Mercedes, Boeing, all, all these companies buy cobalt that's sourced in the Congo. Um, and there's some conversation about doing little bits and pieces of, of, of trying to ameliorate conditions on, on the ground, but it's, it's largely conversation. Um, which comes to the next question is, well, what, what can compel? Can international law help us solve these problems? What, is, what are the levers to be pulled? What are the forces of pressure to be applied? Um, and I don't think there's a, a, a one single bullet uh, to be fired uh, at, at a single target. Um, there has to be um, a, a range of activities uh, beyond just law, awareness raising, consumer advocacy, regulation, um, uh, state within, within countries, uh, uh, regulation, uh, and then there's the international legal context, the, the various conventions around child labor, hazardous labor, forced labor that all these countries um, uh, are signatories to and have domestic law enacted to uh, adhere to those conventions, but then what does that mean? Because it's not solving the problem. Uh, and I think I th the, what I'll throw out there is more, rather than thinking necessarily about um, international law in a, in a sort of theoretical uh, context, let's talk about strategic litigation uh, as possibly creating some precedents that help us move the uh, boundary lines of accountability further up the chain. Um, at some point down the chain, accountability, whether it's legal, certainly not moral or ethical, but, but, but legal gets severed, right? And we need to move that boundary line further up the chain. And I think strategic litigation is, is one way to think about it. I've actually deposed individuals in the Congo and hired a human rights attorney in the US uh, and fronted all of this uh, in order to, to try just that. And we filed a federal lawsuit uh, at the end of 2019 um, on behalf of, of my clients in the Congo uh, uh, who either had a child killed or grievously injured at a mine that I traced was linked to the defendants, which include the major tech and car companies based in the U.S., because this was uh, filed in U.S. federal court. But something could be done similar in other countries, and the point is not to bring harm and conflict to these companies, but to initiate the conversation and the movement in law around responsibility. The simple concept, I'll just end with this, the simple concept, uh, 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 setting aside implementation and all of that. The simple concept is this. The people at the bottom of the chain should be treated with the same dignity and humanity as the people at the top. The people at the bottom of the chain should be treated equally as employees of the company, as the people at the top. And once we accept that basic premise, 
then all of what needs to be done, I think, will be done. Um, and whether it's about uh, top-down regulation, new laws that assign responsibility with criminal uh, penalties potentially, uh, or using strategic litigation, uh, or all of the above to help us move the boundary of accountability further up the chain, I think that's what it will take. Thank you. I mean, I remember a, a few years ago hearing um, Paul Polman, who used to um, be the CEO of Unilever, speak uh, about what you know he thought should be done um, within the sort of global sector about this issue. And it was striking that he didn't talk about law at all, in, you know, because the legal framework, as we've identified, is actually very light in terms of regulating companies. But what he did talk about was, you know, the um, importance of doing the right thing, kind of publicly, morally, and and also the force of social media as well in outing companies with bad practice. But it was very much this like, de desire to be um, doing good governance and being and being a you know a good leader which i think was um far more powerful than than the law but that's not to say that the law shouldn't be um strengthened in in my view it certainly needs to be strengthened so so kate a couple of questions for you um if i may um one um from heather lafferty what um do you think are um, some practical policy prescriptions that the government and firms could introduce to increase transparency in global supply chains. And also a question from Michelle Kolpak. Um, she's asking about um, why, um, the, why the prevalence of um, enslavement um, from Vietnam, Albania and the UK, um, and is it to do with um, the, the governments um, in those countries having um, good mechanisms to identify slavery or because it exists in high numbers. So, we, so why is it, you know, why do we have um, large numbers coming from, from those three nations? And it, is it an accurate reflection of, of what's going on? Do you want to tackle mm -hmm. those? And um, if it's all right with you, I will start with that one. And I'm happy to talk around policy in terms of survivors, but I might hand over to Siddharth and Sarah in terms of the global supply chain things, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, so I think there are multiple uh, reasons why we could see that UK nationals, Albanian nationals and Vietnamese nationals are kind of topping the NRM statistics. Um, I am not convinced it's because the um, countries they're coming from necessarily have good practices because these are people that are being identified within a UK setting. Um, what I would say is that it is probably it's the type of industries and sectors that people are being identified in so Vietnamese um, people are often found in cannabis cultivation um, and grow houses um, as gardeners for the cultivation of the cannabis and also um, in nail bars. Now those are two areas where um, police and multi-agency visits have become very good at going um, and therefore it's a little bit kind of chicken and egg. Are we finding more Vietnamese people because we're looking for more Vietnamese people in those specific sectors? Um, and the same would be true in terms of Albanians being forced into um, forced labour and car washes and also um, the sex industry. So again, um, police and authorities, um, immigration officials are very good at looking in those places. So I think, again, it's the tricky thing with the data and the statistics. Are we finding what we look for? And is that then kind of warping it so that those are the top countries? Um, I do think it's worth saying that I think it was over 130 countries were represented in the NRM statistics um, last year. So we are seeing a wide range of people from a wide range of countries. Um, in terms of practical things, looking at survivor support practice, I know the question was about global supply chains, but in terms of survivor support, I know that there are currently campaigns that are looking at challenging government to change their policies and the law around the length of survivor support. So at the moment, people get supported for quite a short time period, um, and Lord McCall has um, tabled a bill in the House of Lords that is looking at increasing um, the time that survivors get supported for. And another um, policy position that is being taken is around domestic worker visas um, and the links with domestic servitude um, and being, people being forced into labour that way. So those are two policy kind of things that are going on currently that if people are interested in 
um, are kind of worth looking up um, in terms of getting involved in those kind of campaigns. But I think if I can hand to the other two around the global supply chains piece. If I, if I can also as well, because we've only got about five minutes left, I just wanted to ask a couple of other questions and then perhaps I'll go around and then you can choose the one that you'd like to answer. But I wanted to um, ask, uh, uh, first of all, this sort of big question, if you like, about do we need to restructure the global economy? Because we can do all of the sort of support and assistance and all of the trying to regulate you know companies and 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 that sort of thing and and tackle supply chains but you know is that going to solve the problem or do we actually need to address root causes in a much more um holistic way and look at the you know the, the reasons why why people move namely uh, lack of any real um opportunity or lack of um options and and secondly i'm interested in whether you know now we're sitting in this pandemic now we've got climate change looming on the agenda we've got a, a you know a new president in the us you know is it also a good moment to think about how we can when we're looking at these net zero policies bring in policies which are going to be um better uh, globally in terms of um you know the future of work you know a fair distribution of, of you know of of, of, of assets and an equal opportunity so I don't know, Sarah, whichever you'd like to tackle. <laughs> okay, so I will take the business question which is a follow up and maybe it'll help um, answer your um, question about whether we could restructure the global economy. <laughs> what will we do on Tuesday, by the way? But um, when I talked earlier on, didn't I, about how the law could be changed? Um, but I do agree uh, with the kind of caution about law being the kind of the, the silver bullet because I actually think that the leadership of business uh, can make a huge amount of difference and you mentioned Paul Coleman but this is why we've been focusing on financial institutions and their leaders and are doing so tomorrow. We did a piece of work last year talking about how um, slavery had got into supply chains of all the main supermarkets but we identified from that a maturity framework uh, in terms of kind of the four levels of businesses from the kind of the ones we're just about getting there to the ones that were really focusing um, on dealing with this. And, and what we saw was where, you know, human rights was a broad priority, that there was thinking about workers' rights, workers' voice, workers' empowerment, that there was engagement, particularly internationally, with local NGOs, working out what's happening on the ground, not just resist... Um, uh, relying on the audits which are paid for by the suppliers and, and really kind of uh, right for kind of box ticking. Thinking about you know where are our high risk areas like the Congo we've been talking about, what can we do to kind of deep dive into those areas, how can we exploit data to understand what's going on and how can we use technology and apps for workers. So I think there's so much that the leadership of business can do um, and some are doing the problem is that a lot aren't. And it's how we kind of shift that and encourage uh, the right sort of response. Thank you. Siddharth, over to you. Do you want to tackle this issue of the moment we have in the pandemic to deal with climate change and what whether we can add slavery into the mix? I'm glad you mentioned that, Sam, because the pandemic has actually um, uh, had a pretty significant impact, again, at the, at the bottom of the chain. Um, you know, one of the great ironies uh, uh, of what's happening in the Congo, for instance, is um, the, 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 the pandemic created um, a great deal of more pressure for families and children, especially to get in the pits and pull out the cobalt, because a lot of industrial operations were put on pause. Um, uh, and so there was more pressure for people who I suppose I get, were seen as less important, less valuable, more dispensable, because the cobalt had to keep flowing because we rely even more heavily in the last year during the pandemic on all of our gadgets and devices. Um, uh, similarly, um, particularly at the beginning when there was a, a large shutdown of a lot uh, in a lot of sectors, apparel would, would be one big one um, uh, about 10, 11 months ago. Uh, you may remember, for instance, seeing those images from uh, from India of hundreds of thousands of migrant workers en masse leaving urban centers because the factories had been shut down. M many of those were garment factories and they were back in, in villages. And uh, we've actually done some research on the ground of uh, how this has vastly increased vulnerability, increased levels of, of, of debt bondage, 
children pulled out of school uh, uh, in order to uh, work or save money from school fees, whatever it is. So the pandemic has created a lot of strain and stress at the bottom that isn't quite spoken about as much as uh, the very valid pain and strain it's created uh, for people uh, like you and I. Um, and I think it is it does present us a moment to say, okay, so what exactly is going on at the bottom of the global economy? You know, we're 20, 25 years into this process of, of globalizing our economy. So what exactly is going on? And when there are catastrophes like this, what protective mechanisms do we need to have in place to ensure that those who are already not suffering so greatly suffer even more? Uh, because you can knock out one or two generations of progress on things like girl education and public health and savings and income support. You can knock out a whole generation or two of progress with one massive pandemic that just wipes out or uh, 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 creates so much strain uh, at, at the very bottom. And so talking at this moment, taking this moment to talk about what mechani mechanisms need to be in place when we have that next black swan event uh, that derails the economy and derails uh, humanity, um, uh, would that we'll have those conversations. I, 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 I'm, I'm nervous and anxious that our focus is so much at the top and making sure our capital markets continue their upward trend and pumping in liquidity and worrying about home prices and all of that for all of us, and less so what's happening at the bottom. Um, and we will care more when we feel that they touch our lives, when we feel that connection. And I think that's what the important work that needs to be done by researchers, documentary filmmakers, book writers, NGOs like Kate Runs, making, forging those connections so that we do feel the need and the imperative to attend to the, to, to, to the decency and dignity of life at the bottom of the chain. Right, thank you. Kate, do you want to say anything before we end this evening? I think just to echo what Siddhartha said there, I think it is about those connections and it's about understanding that we are talking about real people. Um, we, I, I don't know, personally I have grand ideas of universal basic income, of freedom of movement for all, of everyone having equality and choice. We're not there yet, but what we do need is to take that step to just connect with that one individual. Um, and I've just put in the chat, um, if people want to think about that, check out Slavery Footprint. Um, it came out of Louis de Bacca when he was the American um, um, ambassador for slavery. Um, and it allows you to see as an individual where your life choices and where the services and the things you buy may intersect with slavery. So we've heard tonight that your mobile phone, your technology, all those things, your food may do. And that just kind of gives you a baseline as an individual to think, actually, what do I want to change? And how am I connecting with this issue? So I think it is just that, that connection point. And we each need to start that somewhere so that we can start on our own personal journeys with what we want to be enabling other humans to be experiencing or not. Great, thank you. Well, we have run out of time and what a fascinating evening it's been um, having all of you. I'd like to say a huge um, thank you, first of all, to Dame Sarah, to Siddharth and to Kate um, for uh, speaking this evening, to Bonavera again for hosting. Stay engaged, read their books, read all the reports that are coming out of the um, Anti-Slavery Commissioner. Um, good luck with all your writing and thank you all for your questions, for your comments and um, yes, have a good evening. <laughs>